Welcome to the Proverbs 31 Ministries podcast, where we share biblical truth for any girl in any season. I am your co-host today, Shay Hill, and I'm joined with my friend, Dr. Joel Mutamale. Joel, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm excited for today's conversation. I'm excited as well. So we're back for another episode of Ask a Theologian, and today we're going to tackle the question, why do I feel lonely even when I'm surrounded by people? Um, and the good news is I'm not a theologian, but you are. So let's dive right in, Joel. <laughs> well, I mean, I would, I would start with this. First of all, Shay, do you feel this way ever? Like, totally. What, like the yeah. loneliness aspect of it. What does that look like for you? I would say I may not always feel lonely when I'm surrounded by people, but I would say a word that I more resonate with is like misunderstood. Mm. Like I can say something and kind of ruminate on like, I wonder what they thought about that. Or did I say what I actually wanted to say? Or, like, did that misrepresent my heart's intent? Uh, But then there's definitely times, like, where I feel lonely um, because of that, like, maybe just in a new circle or somewhere that I'm feeling uncomfortable or um, something like that. So that's kind of where I would, I guess, resonate with this in this season of life. Yeah, I mean, for me, this one is right on. Like, I feel like there are times when I can be in a crowd of people um, I could even be the center of attention. Like it could just be like, you know, I'm all in and and from the outside it can feel like, oh yeah, like he's got to be like the most like, um, I don't know, confident and happy and all this stuff. And on the inside, there's this sense of uh, serious loneliness, mm-hmm. you know, like you can be surrounded by a whole bunch of people and still feel completely alone. Yeah. I think moment. sometimes where this also comes to play with, for me, I just kind of thought about this. Um, I have... I don't really have one friend group that I like stick with. I okay. have pockets of people in my life that I'm connected with through different things that I'm involved in. And sometimes when those circles overlap, this was this definitely happened when I was getting married because I was bringing all these people together. They don't know each other. Right. right you know, and right. so sometimes you're <laughs> sitting there trying to connect these people that do not know each other. And that's where sometimes also those feelings of like misunderstanding can come through or maybe not loneliness, but is the right term. But just moments where you can feel like, oh, is this going well? I don't yeah. know how this is going, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think what that exposes for us and this gets to the the, the theological part of this is um, you and I were connected. I think our, our world suggests, it, suggests and even we have come to believe that um, loneliness is connected to proximity, mm. you know? So if I am more uh, near in proximity to people, then the loneliness thing should be dealt with. Like so if I just have... go get around people, yeah. then loneliness will be removed. Yeah, yeah. Like you're lonely because you're by yourself. Right. You know, you're, lo- you're lonely because you're not trying to be out and go out and, and go and do all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, but theologically and biblically, um, loneliness has less to do and relationships have less to do with proximity and everything to do with intimacy. Wow. Everything to do with intimacy. Um, and the thing is, like, there are some pretty common modern day examples, Shay, where we do this. Like, it's one of those things where it's like, whoa, oh, yeah. But then I just want to encourage you, like, you're already doing this. Mm-hmm. Like, you get this concept all right, uh, already. So, Shay, what are some some things that come to your mind when you think about, like, okay, relationship is intimacy and proximity? Okay, when I think about proximity and intimacy being different, this one might be a little bit of a stretch, but it came to mind for me. Um <laughs> Having a gym membership <laughs> or having a gym in your home, living yeah. near a gym, yeah, all of those are proximate, okay? Yeah. But it is not the same thing as showing up and putting in the work by actually working out. Like yeah. you can't just grow or like it grow in strength or um, get healthier by yeah. living close to a gym. Yeah. I wish it was that easy because I, in fact, live very close to a Y. But if I don't show up and put in the work, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. I'm going to, so to that point, (laughs) in our room, we like have this awesome Peloton bike, you know, it's like all the fat, like everybody's going to Peloton. This is in your bedroom? In our bedroom. Okay. Right? So Brit and I have We're spending like a decent amount of time. You're sleeping eight hours a night there. A lot of time (laughs) in this, you know, so there's this Peloton and then I've got some weights that are like right next to it. And I thought like, okay, how easy will it be? Just to jump out of bed. Just grab that, those well, weights. I'm a morning person, so I'm more of a night person. I'll be like a nighttime workout person, you know, so I'm like, like, Brit goes to sleep real fast. So I'll be like, oh, yeah, well, I'm watching football or I'm watching basketball. Like, easily, I can jump on the Peloton bike or I can, you know, uh, get and do some uh, weights. And um, How's that going for you? <laughs> <laughs> is, is this a routine that you've implemented? 
I don't. It has been months since I've. But like proximity. The Peloton is getting dusty. <laughs> oh, it is dusty. Like it is full. Like my kids are on that thing playing more than we are. You know. You're gonna start calling it like this is a unique piece of art. Right. And not. <laughs> yeah. This is an art piece in our yes. in our uh, in our bedroom. Exactly. But again, to the point of like I'm not gonna have the thing that I want just because it's. It's close to me and nearness. The the proximity is there for me. The other one that is like very intimate to me right now, like very personal, is uh, groceries. You know, like the food. Like it's like the food situation. The food situation is bad because I have a personality type where when um, I'm in on something, I'm all in. Right. So it's like I'm going to be healthy. So I'm going to go to Trader Joe's. I'm going to buy all the Trader Joe's things, and it's going to be all healthy and all good. And I have like all these lofty goals in my mind. Like I and and y'all, it is expensive. Trader Joe's is expensive, and so Brick gets so mad at me because I'll get all this stuff, and it all goes bad. That's not good, Joel. Because I still hit up the McDonald's or the Taco Bell on my way home after work. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so the proximity of having groceries doesn't mean that you automatically have, like, meals for the week. You have to do something with it. Yeah, Which exactly. is just an obstacle. Which is just an obstacle. On a little bit more of a serious note, I was thinking about this um, concept of intimacy and proximity. And as I was thinking about the Lord, like, I know that God is, quote unquote, with me all the time. So I, at all times, our proximity should be close Mm -hmm. even like you know i have like multiple bibles in my house or multiple devotion books i mean we have so many books on our bookshelves like there are not there's not just the presence of god there but there's resources about god even scripture which is god breathed around me but then there's totally times where i feel disconnected from him or i don't feel close to him um and i think that like closest kind of ebbs and flows sometimes just depending on where i'm at what kind of season i'm in I'm just being honest. That happens to me where I just feel disconnected sometimes. Yeah. And I think that's a really, really important one because um, when it comes to proximity with God, we have to be very careful that just because we're near the things of God, that we don't con ourselves into believing that we're actually near with God. That's like our nearness so is near true. to wow. God. You know, uh, this is true with like, I mean, it feels like some- that would be easy to happen. I think it happens all the time. Like, right. I think for honest with ourselves, it happens all the time. I mean, even simple things like for me personally, like I've got in my home study, like I've got a whole bunch of books about God, you know, like I've got theology right. books. I've got different types of Bibles. You were mentioning that. Like we live in a day and time where we're so blessed. You know, like my son the other day, I was preaching at church and he like went on to, I was preaching from the CSB Bible and he realized he didn't have it. And so on his phone and his app, he just downloaded the CSB Bible app and he's like live. Like, you know, like you have more access to, to proximity the to the information than yep. ever before. And yet there is something very specific about a bridge that has to be built between the proximity of something and then connecting that thing to like your heart reality, That's you so know? Um, and I think this is actually, I don't think, like I know this is so important in scripture because in Genesis chapters one and two, before you get into the fall, you get God planting a garden. Now in the ancient Near Eastern world, Shay, um, when royal kings, so think um, Mesopotamian, uh, Cain and I, like all these ancient, uh, ancient kind of civilizations, when ancient kings, would build cities at the very center of the city. They would build their kind of castle or like whatever they they would live. And in that place, they would build a royal garden. They would construct a royal garden. The royal garden was the place where the king and his family would hang out, where they would talk, where they would go on walks, where they would spend time with each other, right? So the opening scene of Genesis 1 and 2, it's which is located culturally and socially in an ancient Near Eastern context, you have a good God who is king of the cosmos. And the first thing that he does is he plants a beautiful garden and he calls that garden Eden. And then he places his children, his royal children in Eden. Now we get this indication that it was routine for God to walk and talk with Adam and Eve, right? And we get this from actually Genesis chapter three in verse eight, where God comes down and says that he was walking in Eden. I was studying this and I found something super fascinating. The Hebrew word for walking here. Shay, this is wild. The Hebrew word for walking does not have in mind a destination. The Hebrew word for walking here, it it has connotations of um, leisurely walk without a destination or an end time in mind. Wow. Okay, let me make the connection. Um, Brit loves to walk. She that's like her favorite thing to do. I do not love to walk. I'm not a walker. I don't like to run for fun. I definitely am walking for fun. Okay. So one of the ways that I like love my wife is she'll be like, baby, you want to go on a walk? I'll be like, 
die to self. Yes, I'll do that. Right. I'm going to go on. I heard it said one time that this was not my quote. So, you know, I'm just going to say I heard one time that since men don't like to walk, they decided to take up golfing. Yeah. <laughs> and that is their version of walking and talking. That's true, um, especially if you're in a golf cart, because then you don't even have to walk. You just go in the golf cart and you kind of drive. But right. I'm just going to bypass that. Correct. So we're, like, correct. We're, we're, in, we're in the walk. This is typically what happens is we get out of the house, and um, in my mind, I already have the destination. I'm like, okay, this is what the walk is going to look like. I'm going to walk down this way, and then I'm going to walk back down this way, and then we're going to be done. So that is my understanding of what the walk is. And for Britt, she's like, all right, we get out there, and we do the pattern. We go down this way, and then we go back down this way. And then I'll look at her. I'll be like, you're like, it's time. It's time, right? Like, we're done, right? And she's like, no. I'm just getting started. Yeah. And then I'll be like, well, when are we done? And she's like, I don't know. I'll tell like, you. I wasn't thinking about yeah, it. Like, I'll yeah. And, and so this is super important. For me, when I think about a walk, I'm thinking about destination in mind. I've got something to accomplish and do. But for Brett, when she goes on a walk, she could care less about the destination. She cares more about the intimacy that's built as we're on the way to the destination. That's super interesting because as you're talking about what the how symbolic the garden was, it was a place. It sounds like it was a place of connection and, com- and community. So then that combined with a leisurely walk. I mean, God had such re- they had such close relationship. relationship. I- ideal relationship yes yeah I mean, it I was mean, ideal because it's growing like right. part of the relationship too is like like Brent and I've been married for 14 years like we are we are still getting to know each other every day like we are growing individually and we're growing together um Shay you and I have been friends for like eight years now mm-hmm. you know and think about when we had first met I remember the first time I met you um and the first time we really I don't know out. what you're about to I say know, I know I'm know. very nervous oh it's, it's amazing <laughs> I remember the first time that we that we like really hung out was we were working on one of Lisa's book projects and we we're up in the mountains uh-huh. and we had a like a research writing retreat and Bryn the entire family came out and so it was like a working thing but we also had family together and um um, you somehow drew the uh, like the short stick of having to watch the kids because I think bro was on a work call or something. So you're like helping out with my boys. And there was a moment where Lee like and we were recording a oh, video for the this. publisher. Y'all were on like a yes, y'all were recording like this is our research for like what we want Lisa's next book to exactly. be. Exactly. And so we're like it's supposed to be professional and like we're you know this is a big deal. And then all of a sudden I think it was Levi. All of a sudden Levi runs into the camera scene and he's like Dad I've got and I'm like I'm trying to grab him. Trying to push him off you come running up the stairs because you realize like one of the boys is not here and you know and it's like oh like that okay think about where we were relationally as friends and as a family and all this other stuff to where we are today right like it, it has grows, grown evolved. it has changed as a you like levi's gonna be 11 you know like that's crazy you know um and so that is the the focus isn't just proximity over time proximity has changed you've been here i've been there we've moved to different houses but it's the relationship that happens in between the distance that is so vitally important and how that all grows so that's what it looked like for adam and eve to walk with god before the fall absolutely not this is also super super important adam and eve prior to the fall had intimacy with god which actually the byproduct was proximity Mm. So look at the flow. The flow is intimacy first, then proximity, right? It's not the proximity doesn't matter. It's just that what necessitates the proximity is intimacy. Okay, sin enters in Genesis chapter 3. What does sin do? Sin actually despoils, it ruptures intimacy. And as a result of the rupture of intimacy, what is the consequence? Proximity changes. So Adam and Eve are kicked out of, they're expelled, they're sent out of the Garden of Eden. And so their proximity actually is a visual representation of a spiritual, physical, and emotional intimacy change that actually took place. Until Jesus. Until Jesus. Came to restore the access that we have to be proximate to God. Absolutely. So the story of scripture from Genesis 3 until Jesus comes in the incarnation is like if I were to like summarize it, it'd be like, God's like, I got to have my family back together. Like, think about this. God's like, man, it'd be nice to go back on a walk in a walk with those, with those folks in Eden again. It'd be nice to return to that, you know? And I think it's super fascinating that when Jesus comes in the incarnation, he spends a lot of times in gardens. He's with his disciples. He's walking everywhere with them, you know? Like, it's almost like what you have with Jesus in his lived experience in his earthly ministry is a return and almost picking up where Adam and Eve left off. And I can't imagine, like, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, 
right? Um, he's got these two men. It's post-resurrection, and they're on a walk. And Jesus is like, sure, I'll go, on, I'll go on a walk with them and talk with them. Like, that's beautiful. Right. That is the picture of relationship and how um, we should be thinking about the reality of loneliness in the midst of, well, is there intimacy in this relationship or not? What is the quality of that intimacy? And does the intimacy, um, health or lack of dictate the proximity reality that we have with others? That's so good. So we're going to get into some examples of people in scripture that actually felt lonely. But as you're talking about this just came to me and I think it's super interesting as you're talking about this concept of proximity and intimacy and how Jesus was able to restore the access or redeem the access that we have to God through his sacrifice. It got me thinking about Hebrews four in real time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Hebrews four 15 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's talking about how he has, come as our faithful high priest, not just to sympathize, but also he's been tempted in every way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as he came to earth, he came on a mission to restore the intimacy and the proximity really that we could have with God. Absolutely. Because the two are related. The next verse, I do not have this in my notes, so okay. I will not quote it because it will be wrong. The next verse, Hebrews 4, 16 set is the verse that talks about us approaching the throne of God boldly. Boldly with confidence. Proximity. Proximity. I mean, yeah. that's so and good. Throne room, this is so wild. Throne room, what is throne room? Throne room is Eden language. Right. Because Eden so is actually the, the royal throne garden of God. To restore us back to Eden. access yes. to God and access in the garden. Crushed it. That is so brilliant. We're changing. That is so You're, legit. You are a theologian. Oh, no. Let's go. <laughs> okay, we'll see. I had one comment. So we'll, so we'll see. I'm not, not taking this over just yet. Brilliant. But I think as we were prepping for this conversation and just talking about loneliness, we spent some time talking about people in scripture who actually felt um, lonely or misunderstood or isolated. And we kind of broke these two types of people into two different categories. The first is that loneliness can be a reality of something that you've done to yourself. Like there is a circumstance that has happened that has caused you to remove yourself. And there's many examples that we could have mentioned here for this, but um, one that came to mind was Jonah's disobedience that led him to ending up alone. So that was something that he chose that path of disobedience and it led him to being isolated. Yeah, and he ran. I mean, he, he, ran. he ran from God and part of the run was- Ran to, from God and ran from people. And ran from people. I mean, yeah, I mean, got, got thrown out of a boat from people. That's, think about loneliness, like right. in the midst of a whole bunch of people right he's in a boat with a bunch of people <laughs> and god had a purpose all along yeah. but there's no doubt that he chose acts of disobedience that led him in that place so Absolutely. that's the first thing mm -hmm. is that something you've done to yourself or you've isolated yourself um and then the second example is that loneliness can be something that happens to you yes so this is more of a situation where something happened and you were casted out by yes. a circumstance a situation or by an actual person and an example of this is Joseph in the story um, and the part of the story where he is at Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife tells a lie about him, misrepresents him. And then Joseph gets thrown out of Potiphar's house. And where does he go from Potiphar's house? He goes to prison. He goes to prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, how costly of that choice that led him to, into such a place of isolation and still in this place of loneliness, like God had a plan, even when Joseph did the right thing and the wrong thing happened, God was still with him, but mm -hmm. he still felt lonely. Yeah. And no doubt he felt misunderstood. Yeah. And the important one on, on the Joseph narrative is um, there's this actually um, narrative uh, literary technique that's actually happening. This is in Genesis 39. It's pretty amazing. Uh, we believe Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. This is called um, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so what I think Moses is doing is is wild. Moses starts Genesis 39 in the first few verses. He makes a narrative note. Like as a, it's like, think about this. Think about being um, in a show um, and then there's a voice outside of the show. It's a narrator and the voice speaks in to give you a detail about what's happening, but the people in it don't know what's, what's taking place. This is what we're reading in scripture. So in scripture, it's almost like there's this voice on the outside and says, there's this phrase, and the Lord was with Joseph. And the very next scene is Potiphar's wife. Wow. And then you go through the entire thing and he does the right thing, right? And he does the right thing and the right thing puts him into prison, into a pit. And that last section ends, the voice is back, ends and says, and the Lord is with Joseph. Mm. So this entire narrative is actually bookended by this biblical truth that God was with Joseph. Now, here's the thing. I'm unsure and uncertain that Joseph himself was acutely aware, intimately aware of the nearness of God 
in the way that you and I now know that absolutely God was there because we can see the work and the hand of God in each part of his story, which to me makes me want to say, hey, we should really slow down and just be aware in the midst of our loneliness where it feels like we're truly and utterly alone. None of these events are making sense. I'm doing the right thing. And even when I did the right thing, it's putting me into a deeper sense of loneliness. Like, just be aware that the same narrative kind of element is true of our lives today. Right. And there's a good God on the outside who's just saying, by the way, God's with you. Yeah. God was with Jonah. God was with Joseph. But also our last example, God was with Jesus when he experienced loneliness. Yeah, absolutely. So the Jesus one is is is, uh, is fascinating to me, Shay. You read the Hebrews 4.15 passage. Um, there's uh, the book of Isaiah. It is so powerful. It is so full of messianic prophecies. I mean, Isaiah as a prophet, my man went through it. Like <laughs> he had to deal with some stuff. Um, but we get some of the more clear indications of who Jesus is and the situation that Jesus would be in. So Isaiah 53, 5 says, uh, Isaiah talks about Jesus and saying that he would be, um, he's despised. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, I mean, think about, think about Again, the human reality, go back to what Lisa has taught us. What is the human condition of the biblical text here? How do you feel when you're rejected? Mm-hmm. How do you feel when you're despised? How do you feel when you're not valued? My oldest son right now is navigating through some stuff in school. Um, we have made the decision as a family for a lot of reasons, but part of it is some data that's come out with um, social media and some other stuff uh, where we're holding off on social media for as long as humanly possible. Um, he's in sixth grade. This is kind of difficult right now because all of his friends have social media. They're on TikTok and Instagram and all of this stuff. Now, it doesn't help that his mom is a social media influencer. Like, you know, she's got all the things on TikTok and, uh, and Instagram. But the other day he came home and he was very upset, you know, and he was like, I just feel like I'm so alone. I'm just feel isolated. And I'm like, what happened? He's like, you guys won't let me have social media. And I'm like, dude, slow down. Like, what is going on? But he had to for a day just kind of had to deal with that reality. Now, how did he feel? He felt alone. He felt rejected. He felt like he didn't fit in. He like felt, he was missing out. He felt like he was missing out. He felt mm-hmm. lonely, even though he's with 115 other sixth graders in that, you know, because of these situations. The text here tells us that Jesus understands that. He felt it. He lived it. He experienced it. And those first two examples that we have of um, loneliness can be a reality of something that we've done ourselves or loneliness can be something that has happened to us. I just want to point out that in the same way that Hebrews talks about um, how Jesus has experienced that, Jesus himself did it. So what is something that Jesus did himself? Jesus, this is Philippians 2, Jesus willingly in the incarnation he, um, he took on human flesh and he left the divinity of heaven to come onto earth. He willingly did that, right? He did that to himself. In a sense, he separated himself from from God himself in his humanity. He was led and empowered by the Spirit. He had union with God the Father. All those things were true, but it was different in the incarnation than it was prior to the incarnation. Now, what is something... Just to pause really quick. Yeah, He came to earth completely man and completely God at the same time. It's called the hypostatic union. So both of these at the same time to a world that was fallen where he would be born to sinful parents. Yes. Coexist around sinful people. Mm -hmm. uh, Coexist around uh, corrupt, sinful government leaders. You better believe Caesar. The amount of misunderstanding and religious religion like he had church hurt totally like he had church wounds he's like absolutely he's like yo what is happening over he had, here he experienced all these isolating situations Every because of his human condition that he felt everything that we felt and now some feel. people might be like well hey joel like what about my specific thing did my specific so a lot of times the bible is talking in principle in generalities right and so even if jesus may not have in his earthly human life experienced the very specific thing that you're thinking of think about principally he did and Honestly, whatever we experience on earth pales in comparison to what he experienced on the cross. Wow. And I'm going to actually talk about this as, as this next thing. What is the next thing? What happened to him? On the cross, Jesus was actually literally separated from God the Father on the cross. He was the recipient of loneliness. On the cross, Jesus experienced the truest, darkest, 
most devastating loneliness than any human could have ever experienced because in that moment, he actually, God the Father himself, turned his back on Jesus. Look at, um, you're like, Joel, prove it. Happy to. Matthew 27, 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why did this have to take place? Because in that moment, Jesus became our atoning sacrifice. He became our propitiation. C.S. Lewis refers to this way as the great exchange that um, we get the righteousness of Christ and he got all of our unrighteousness, all of our sin. And here's the thing, a, like, a holy God can have nothing to do with sin. So when Jesus becomes the atoning sacrifice, God the Father turns away from the Son for a moment so that Jesus could be our faithful high priest. Jesus experienced the utter depth of loneliness so that you and I would never have to experience loneliness from God ever again if we would just submit ourselves to Jesus and trust him with our lives. Absolutely. And I think we can just be so comforted through the examples that we talked through that whether we've gone through a season where we've made some choices that we've chosen to remove ourselves or isolated ourselves or even like, you know, maybe a less intense version of this could be we're living in a new city and we chose to make that move, but yet we're not, we haven't met like new community or, yeah, you know, so made, made new best friends. Or if this is something that happened to us, like a strong rejection or a, a friendship breakup or a family member that's not speaking to us because of a decision that we made. Either way, wherever you find yourself, whatever the source was that landed you in a place of lonely, Jesus understands. And we want to be so sensitive that obviously through this one conversation, um, it's not going to ease loneliness completely or yeah. perfectly in us. But I think it would be good for us to end today with just some things to consider. If you are listening today and you're like, I need like a practical next step. I've been hanging out in these feelings of lonely for too long. So I have a couple things that I want to run through before we finish up today. The first thing is, it's these are all in question formats. Have you been honest with people around you about where you're at or what you're going through? Joel, if there's one thing that I hate being, it is, well, really, these are really two things, but they kind of go together. It's being an inconvenience mm. or it's being needy. Mm. Like, I do not want to be, I think it's the only child or the oldest child in me that is like, I will not be the one that you have to worry about. Yep. But where I get myself into trouble with this is that sometimes I can hold something really close to my heart that I'm going through and not bring other people into it because I don't want to seem needy and I don't want to inconvenience him with what I'm going through. But it cuts off this um, access point where we can take our relationship to the next level through intimacy yeah. and through vulnerability. But it takes me saying, hey, this is actually what's going on in my life. Yeah. And so the thing to consider he here is I just want you to think about, is there an opportunity for you to deepen some relationships that you're already in simply by being more honest about where you're really at or what's really weighing on you? And I would just clarify, um, you don't have to go to zero to 160, right? No, actually, I would recommend that we not do that. And I would say do this with the right people yes. and in the right circumstances. Perfect. Like I, what I'm not saying is go on Instagram and start telling people <laughs> this is actually what I've been walking through. I'm talking about people that you actually sit with shoulder to shoulder face so to face good. and they can see the tears in your eyes and mm. you can tell them hey when you've been asking me how i've been doing recently i haven't been fully honest i need to tell you what's going on so, so you can good. know how to pray for me you may not be able to do that with everyone in your life i would say like use self-awareness and emotional maturity to really think about who those people are but just consider is this an opportunity that can help ease the loneliness ache in you the second thing is have you been honest with yourself about what your expectations are in specific relationships. I think sometimes we're disappointed in a relationship and we feel lonely because we haven't articulated what we need or what we expect from that specific person. And I think we also have to be honest about what we have to give and what we need to give others the space to do the same. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, this is just healthy boundary setting happening in real time. I think as seasons change, as relationships change, there are different capacities and preferences that we have. Um, even in something as simple as like communication, think about all the different ways that we have to connect with the people around us. We have face-to-face -face communication. There's texting, audio messages, mm -hmm. which is my least favorite, if I can say that on this podcast. <laughs> audio messages, um, phone calls, FaceTime, like emails. All, emails, all of these avenues that we can communicate. And I just Slack wonder, channels. Slack channels. I just wonder how many of us 
are waiting for someone to pick up the phone and call us when maybe they're not in a season to be able to do that. And I think just being honest that, you know, circumstances change and things change. I have a friend that just moved across the country. And before she moved, we saw each other in person all the time. I never had to worry. Am I going to hear from so-and-so today? Mm. I knew that I would. Sometimes she would just come down to my desk because we're actually coworkers. <laughs> we would just talk. Right. But now in this season of life, there has been a situation change. And now there's a need for me to call her more than I used to. Yeah. And that's a privilege because it's a friend that I have that I love. But also, if I wasn't making that choice to reach out to her and call her or to try to connect with her or to pick up the phone when she calls me, I would start to feel lonely or that yeah. there had been like a change in our friendship. And we so, have a mutual friend, Shay. Yeah. Um, may, it might be the same person you're talking about, maybe not, uh, but uh, also boundaries in the type of really like conversations we have. We have a great group chat that we talk. A lot of the Ask a Theologian questions come out of yeah. this group chat. And uh, one day I responded with a voice memo and our friend responded and said, you know I don't do voice memos. <laughs> she know? boundaried you. She boundaried me. And so again, that's super important in this discussion. Yeah, so not only let's, to consider if there's an opportunity to deepen the relationships that we have. But if there has been a circumstance change in a friendship that we used to hold really close, then maybe they're now in a different season. Okay, well, we can assess the change that needs to be made there, but also we are constantly changing. So are there people around you that you're seeing in your weekly life, whether it's as you're picking your kids up from school or you're going to your gym or um, church, are there people in those circles that you haven't yet connected with um, relationally just because they're kind of new, you know, so but good. as, as we change, I think our circles can change. So this, the thing to consider here is, is there an opportunity to broaden the circle of the relationships that you do have? So good. So the first two is, have you been honest with people? Have you been honest with yourself? And this last one would be, have you been honest with God about the depth of your loneliness and your desire for that to be eased? So a couple things to just question and consider, have you been honest with God about your needs? And I know you'd be like, well, Joel, doesn't he already know? Well, he does know. And he also invites us to verbally and literally share those things with him as a means of communication. You know, my wife knows so much about me, but until I actually say it, the saying and the doing and the processing together is what actually draws us together in intimacy. So have you been honest with the Lord about your needs? The second thing, have you been honest with him about how you wish those needs would be met? You know, like if you could have it any way that you wanted, how would that way be met? Uh, think about examples like you're single or you long for a family or the job, the vocation or the location that you want to live geographically, like all of those things. Um, and then this, this last one is so important. Then are you willing to humbly submit to how he answers? So it's one thing to express your needs. It's another thing to let your let God know like how you wish that they would be answered. But then it's a different thing to, in humility, say, and God, you know all these things, but you know all and I know limited. In the midst of my limitations, I'm going to humbly submit to how you determine how you choose to answer this. And so um, a side note and a thought about this that I think is important sometimes when God doesn't answer things or we find ourselves in loneliness because of a relationship that hasn't flourished the way that we want it to, we have to be aware that it is possible that loneliness might actually be means of momentary protection from God to protect you from something that um, is coming that you did not even know was there or as a potential to be there. And so even though in the moment it might be painful, in the long run, God might actually be protecting you from something. It's so good. I love that. As we've been talking about loneliness today, I think it's really crucial to mention that, like we've kind of talked about throughout this conversation, that sometimes when we're struggling with loneliness, it's easy to feel disconnected from God. And especially when we feel like he's not intervening in our circumstances. And um, I would love to tell our friends about a new Bible study that is out. And I'm going to let you tell them about it because you actually co-authored it. I know. It's super exciting. So we have 30 Days with Jesus, and um, it's a co-authored Bible study that uh, Lisa Turkers and myself worked on. Shay, you had a massive role on this, and so um, your fingerprints are all over this study. Uh, and I don't know about you, but like Shay, for me, I've always wondered, like, did Jesus just show up in the New Testament? Like, are we supposed to wait for the, for Matthew to show up for us to get to the good stuff? Um, and throughout this study, like, we'll actually show you know that Jesus is present from Genesis all the way through the New Testament, um, and that he is intimate, that he's near, he's a provider, he's a protector for us. Um, and I think it's just going to be 30 very powerful days of walking through the reality of Jesus with you. That's amazing. And if you are interested in that study guide, then make sure you check out the link in our show notes. And also make sure you stay connected with us, whether that's on YouTube or leaving a podcast review 
you. Or you can find Joel on Instagram and drop in a question on his Theology Talk Tuesday. Yeah. And maybe we'll see that question for one of our next special episodes of Ask a Theologian. Joel, thanks so much for this conversation today. I always enjoy our time together and just opening scripture and, and talking about uh, just real life stuff. This really, really blessed me today. So friends, we'll see you back next time on the Proverbs 31 Ministries podcast. And as always here at Proverbs 31 Ministries, we believe when you know the truth and live the truth, it changes everything.